Hello everyone, and welcome to another edition of DF Direct Weekly. I'm Audi, and I'm so happy to be here today. It's been a while since I've been back, but here I am. But luckily, this beautiful, delightful hour we're gonna have is gonna be so much tastier because, of course, we have the fresh and crispy Richard Ledbetter. <laughs> I honestly don't know what to say about that introduction. Uh, we, we, you could possibly invert it and it would be true. Crispy and fresh? Mm -hmm. well, I guess I could call you Scrooge. <laughs> yes, you could. I, I, I noticed you've been reading my back catalogue recently. Oh, I keep tabs, my friend, I keep tabs. <laughs> but this sandwich needs protein, and we got the most ham man on the team. It is John Lindman. Yeah, you're not wrong, so yeah, here we are. <laughs> How's it going there, John? Pretty good, pretty good. Good to have you back. I'm just stretching out time so I can get your, uh, you know, the lower thirds to show up enough so they can see who you are. Oh, right. That's right. That, that's always the trick with editing is you kind of got to talk long enough during the introduction so you can do that. And then well, you, you cut you to the next too person. Well, you talk too long now. Oh, sorry. sorry. Welcome. <laughs> oh. But, my goodness, gentlemen, the condiment we have today for this delightful meal is unlike any other. We brought the sauce today. It is Ars Technica's own Sam Makovich. Hey everybody, uh, are you calling me ketchup because of the red hair? Because I'm not liking the beginning of this journey. I, I said good condiments, sir. Okay. Not ketchup. Okay. Well, we don't ruin food on digital. <laughs> well, we, as an American, I'm sure that our sauce interplay is going to be absolutely terrible and disagreed upon. So I'm not even going to start uh, hating on mayonnaise just yet. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of types of the mayonnaise. Speaking of which, there's a lot of news today, and we gotta get the show rolling. So, let's get started. As the people who watch the retro show know, me and John, we do enjoy putting our pajamas on and having a sleepover. But we got all our friends here today, so we're gonna make this a play date. And Sam, on Ars Technica recently, you did an amazing article on a brand new console, a handheld, that is called Nothing Else But The Play Date. So uh, just to freshen people's minds, if they haven't even seen it, introduce it. What is the Playdate and what makes it so special? Oh, you mean this thing, the Playdate? Uh, this is a $179 uh, portable console. Uh, I can't do the conversion, please. Put it beneath my face right now uh, with the biggest Euro, pound, and other fonts possible. Uh, it is going to be launching by the end of 2021. It's been in the works for years from a company in the States down near Portland, Oregon called Panic. Panic's been in the news more recently be as a game publisher of Firewatch and Untitled Goose Game, among other projects, but they've been working on software for years. I know they've got an FTP client that was beloved at one time, uh, and they t partnered with, uh, I believe it's Teenage Engineering to get to work on this little system. Uh, and the idea is $179 gets you a weak console with a crank. It's got it's it turns forwards and backwards, completely analog, uh, also has D pad and A and B buttons and has a season of 24 video games that will upload to the system. As soon as you buy it, your season starts, meaning as soon as it turns on. So if you get it next year, you have to, I believe, artificially wait every week for two games to be uploaded from the server, as opposed to buying it later and getting all 24 games. But that's the sales pitch is maybe the games are not $180. Maybe this system and its weak processor are not $180, but the combination and that sort of surprise element of getting these games at a trickle feed made by indie developers you've heard of, uh, that's the, that is the sales pitch that's been coming along. And I had been curious for a long time of, okay, well, is it going to really be a thing? And is in the chip shortage world, is it actually going to appear? And out of nowhere, they reached out and said, you get three weeks to play with it. Here you go. You have it. Play with it. It's near final hardware. So don't go talking about the OS or the menus because those are still being tweaked. But here's the whole thing and four of the games and you can go crazy with it. And crazy I did. A lot of, a lot of cranking on the bus, which uh, <laughs> is the most uh, allowed way I'm allowed to, to say and do that sort of thing. Um, but I can go in a zillion directions because this is a fascinating device and it's not necessarily perfect, but I think it's pretty fantastic. Well, define crazy. What did you actually do with it? What have you actually got to sample? Sure. Uh, the idea is that when you get the system, they want it all to be a surprise, but they were unfettered in terms of saying you can talk about the four games that come on it. Uh, the ones that I have include Kranken's Time Travel Adventure, which is made by Kaita Takahashi along with a couple of other developers. Um, there's also 
Lost Your Marbles, Saturday Edition, and White Water Wipeout. Those are the four games that are packed in, uh, and they range. Uh, the, let, let's start with Kranken's uh, Time Travel Adventure, because that's so the one... Real, the, I think it's important to note that uh, the developer of that, uh, Takahashi-san, was the, the man kind of who helmed the team behind Katamari Damashi yeah, and say. Nobi Nobi Boy. So yes, two very event. bizarre games of the past that were very popular. So it's really cool to actually have him on board for this. Absolutely. That was, and uh, he, his team was one of the first to get locked in. And when I saw this device in 2019 for my first time, it was the only game ready, very brief demo. But the idea is the little character, a little two-dimensional character, but with some sort of vector trickery to move the different parts around. So it looks almost 3D on this screen, moves when you move the, the the wind moves in a specific timeline so the timeline is predetermined and you crank either very slowly to move the character or fast 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 to make that character run through that timeline but everything else in the world happens at normal speed so the puzzles play out in a way of oh when i crank a little slower then i can dodge for example a butterfly flying up and down and at one point on your timeline as you are walking you'll notice there's a flower beneath you and your character will bend over so you want to time the crank perfectly so your character bends over avoids the little butterfly now you'll notice what i'm talking about is not the most intense kind of gaming anecdote possible it's very cute which fits uh, takahashi san's output but also it's an it's representative of the kind of games you're going to get on the system because it's combined processing power i believe it's got two separate processors one tops out at 180 megahertz and the other at 80 megahertz so this is not necessarily going to crank out quake but it does run doom the people who make uh, Playdate have put out videos of what developers have done with the limited s sets that have been out there and there is a mocked up version of doom running in entirely one bit black and white where if you get the chain gun you start cranking you start cranking and the chain gun will shoot at the rate of whatever you crank i feel like there, there there's room to to take a concept like that and make something complete out of it right like not necessarily explain doom itself on there probably not the best experience but i'm sure they could take that kind of mechanic and apply it elsewhere well, I mean, they had to rush to the to answer the can it run Doom since that's sort of the default. And it was <laughs> oh, yeah, smart yeah, on their yeah, part yeah. to do so. Of, of course, of course. But the, of course, then we're talking about one bit, uh, one bit color. Now, I'm going to hold this up to the camera for the viewers to see how the light pops based on whether it's catching ambient light or not, because it's a one bit panel and it's not backlit. That's because they are using a sharp e-reader display, which I'm pretty sure was the genesis of this whole project. Essentially, they came to find that these specific sharp e-reader displays, which you can buy in bulk for about $45 American, have great refresh rates, 30 to 50 frames a second. They don't quite get to 60, but it has no ghosting. The, the, the refresh on this is incredible. So when you are playing something that's running at 30 frames a second unlocked, you're not seeing a bunch of jitter, you're not seeing ghosting, and you're getting a resolution that is about four times that of the original Game Boy. So when it's also completely one bit, only black and white, you take you know that resolution and you can add dithering and other finer pixel effects to essentially create Game Boy caliber pixelation with dithering to fill in the cracks. It's an interesting thing you mentioned about the lack of ghosting on that display, because that is actually a characteristic of those non-backlit, uh, sometimes color displays. Like if you go back to the Neo Geo Pocket Color or the Game Boy Color specifically, or even the original Game Boy Advance, those also have very, very pin sharp kind of scrolling that doesn't exhibit the typical LCD blur, uh, which I think is tied to not having a backlight. And, and that's the thing about this device that a lot of people talk about is that it's underpowered and it's not backlit. And I don't know about y'all, but when I look around on YouTube channels about classic game consoles, it's usually can we add a backlight to our favorite old consoles? Our favorite old portable ones, pardon me. And this one absolutely rejects that. And the result is I've been out to pubs, uh, you know, with a mask on in, in the limited times where the Delta wasn't quite hitting us yet, handed this to friends. And it really depended on the angle that someone was standing in, in a dim room. Literally could not see the action. Stepped a few steps over, caught some ambient light. They were good to go. Here in my apartment in Seattle, I get all the ambient light I need to see everything very clearly. And I'm stunned by how nice it looks, but I can't crawl into bed and, and without having some sort of light on and, you know, crank under the covers. Like I need some sort of lighting without the backlight. By the way, I'm going to keep on saying all the cranking grossness whenever possible. Um, but I, it's an interesting it's an interesting trade off, but I really do believe that they saw how good the screen was and said, 
let's start with the screen and go from there to make a console and then from there fit in the low powered system and the crank and that other it, it's a differentiation of subtraction yeah, so i heard about this like you a few times already like i think the last like a year or two and just kind of like short premises and whatnot but it was really your article that showed me the potential of this because you can kind of compare this to somewhat of a pico 8 scenario where you have intentionally underpowered uh hardware in that case but the experimentation and the technical limitation that comes with that means that you're going to have games that are unlike anything else you're going to find on most other consoles or handhelds and especially in today you know where we have new sensibilities applying that backwards to uh, these limitations is very interesting. Absolutely. And, and I would say, I really hope, based on the fact that you can code on this just with straight up C, you can also use Lua, but if you just want to go with straight up C, put whatever you want on there, it unlocks very easily. You just plug the USB uh, type C connector into your computer and you download the dev kit, which is widely available, and you are good to go. They're also going to be releasing a web portal for coding your own sort of basic things um, in terms of creating your own sprites, your own music and your own logic. So if you want to make your own just build from scratch games as a, like, as a budding programmer, that's an option. But being able to go directly going to see means I really hope that there's just a collection of Pico games that fans who buy this can download and dump on there because it's got four gigs of onboard storage. So that would be an option there. I'm actually intrigued enough that I have ideas of what I want to do once that uh, software comes out. And they've shown some uh, screenshots of it now and it looks very easy to figure out it's very clear you know what functions are there and you can go deeper like you say and you know really tinker with your game and it's just an amazing uh, product to me because also uh, they've been hiring or employing a lot of you know, students to figure out games on this and it's really interesting to see what new minds can bring to what is essentially kind of old technology. I mean, I will say this is designed for a small dev team and quick turnaround. You're not going to make a bazillion dollars either being part of the season pass or whenever they open up the uh, Playdate marketplace, which will happen at some point. You're not going to get games that are worth more than $10 in terms of depth and staffing because it is limited because you have to keep the game sizes down to around 100 megs. They say in their in their dev notes is too much. Like you really have to go to compression town in terms of music and animation. But that that specific limiting factor, I think, will, leads to something that some people will say, you know what? I don't need this. I can spend one hundred eighty dollars just on software for the computing devices I already own or, oh, I want to go and throw my one hundred eighty dollars at an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi and sort of build my own thing. Those options are out there. And what I think is really clever is that they look at this and they say, how can we make this a very specific product that people will look at and know they either do or do not want? I don't think there's anybody who looks at this banana yellow thing and dreams of it being a super megged up uh, Neo Geo 70,000 dream device that plays all of your favorite King of Fighter games like it, there's it knows what it is. It, it's loud about it. And if this yellow guy isn't specific enough of a hint, it comes with a GameCube purple kind of carrying case when it eventually launches. So I appreciate them being that loud and saying, guess what? There is a big enough gaming market where we can be this boutique device, sell tens of thousands of these and do just fine as a ha hardware manufacturer. And yeah, that's I mean, the, the pre-orders already opened up right last week. That's correct. They, and they, they, they were like 20,000. They sold out of 22,000 within about 20 minutes. Unfortunately, their web store did not understand any continent outside of North America. So anyone who's watching from Europe basically has a reason to be angry about missing that boat, even though they had said all the initial uh, orders would be available overseas. Uh, but you can order now. They did not set a stop, unlike other uh hardware pre-sales as of late. So if you want to buy it, you can go in and they're just going to adjust their manufacturing for early 2022 accordingly. But that first batch of 22,000 is, is set. Yeah, the 2021 batch has been, uh, I was, uh, I forgot the sale and I unfortunately came a bit late. So it was 2022 regardless. So, uh, but uh, it's so interesting. Also, you mentioned with the season stuff, the fact that these games will come out in season packs. It means that you're technically bringing that community together during that season and people will be talking about the same games and figuring them out together. And this reminds me very much of like, say, on the NES, you know, when we got Zelda for the first time, we went to the schoolyard and we explained to each other, what, how did we do this? What did we find? 
and it feels like that kind of a scenario again. Yeah, and, and to be clear, not every game uses the crank, and there's a game called Saturday Morning that is just a dumbed down point and click, just the D-pad and buttons, where you move a character around and solve mild puzzles and go through dialogue. It's the longest of the, the games I have on here, but I do believe we are going to get stuff like that. That's That potential in this season is that it's just going to be surprising. Now, on the other hand, while we're still talking, I'm just going to show uh, Giles Goddard's game he was the man who coded the face on super mario 64 along with a bunch of other stuff and he's made a tribute to california games surfing mode and it's just you use the crank to directly direct the direction of the surfboard and i think i've already i've already kind of died but i have to hold it up and again here's one of the drawbacks is you have to hold the screen up just so in order to see it but the idea the thing that I, just to close out my thoughts on this the analog crank lets you decide a direction without a velocity and it lets you keep that direction constant. I think that's interesting for things like a spaceship simulator or managing a turret or in this case a skateboard because you can't in real life you can't take your joystick and turn it the opposite direction and immediately turn your surfboard or skateboard. You have to kind of go in those directions and so games that look at analog control and say wait the physical limitation means I have to account for that. I think that's an interesting brain space and I want to see that exploited. And I do believe this is enough processing power to do that to some extent. Is the crank aluminum? Does it feel solid? Yes, it is an aluminum solid crank. I uh, I hooked up 7,000 testing robots to it and cranked it five gazillion. I'm kidding. Uh, no, but throughout all of my testing, it is yet to break off. It's yet to feel brittle. And the, the plastic exterior additionally feels kind of like, I, I would say uh, an amiibo toy in terms of that plastic, but it hasn't felt like it's, it hasn't felt like it's going to crust off. It hasn't felt like it's going to uh, stick to my hand or anything it, like it that. Feels it feels solid. Yes. What about the sound then? How, how is, what kind of sound does it reproduce? One of my favorite things, I don't know if the mic is going to pick this up, but if you set up the volume, it's a very mild mono speaker. It also has a 3.5 millimeter jack. Even though it's tiny, they made room for that. Thank you. And uh, the tiny speaker is not going to cut it if you're trying to hear it over any other din. It's only for a silent room. What about the actual sound itself? Like, what are the capabilities of it? What kind of sound can it play? Yeah, I, it, I mean, it, they tell in the dev notes, they suggest that people use OGG. Uh, Vorbis in it for, for music. Oh, okay. so, so like it can just straight up play digital audio files. Correct. Okay, that's what that's what I'm getting at. Yes. Cool. So I'm kind of uh, just intrigued by this concept of uh, basically a device that has set technical limitations that basically provoke, encourage uh, creativity uh, as opposed to, you know, pushing the state of the art. So it's very concept driven. But I am sort of wondering about this this season and the deployment of games. Was it like two games in a, a week or how does it work? That's correct. Yes, two two games a week. And they've said, and they could change this by the time it all launches, but they've said you don't get the games until you turn it on and connect it to their server. It's got Wi-Fi on it. You can also, again, hook up USB-C to add your own. But you get once once you get your account all matched up, then you get your first two games. Seven days later, it'll tell you your next two games are ready and so on. And the developers have been announced and some of the game names. Uh, and, and there are other developers working on things who are not part of the season. Uh, biggest name, I would say, is Lucas Pope, who's working on a sort of... Uh, alien bar bouncer game where you use the crank to look through different slits of a door to identify the alien species and decide whether you'll let them in or not. So there's I, I don't have the list of developers handy, but it's a mix of people I've never heard of and developers whose games I've seen at conventions in the past and really respect. So is the uh, the, the season mechanic part of the uh, the price you pay or is it extra? That is correct. That's this first season, and they say first as if to hint at maybe more to come, but the first season's included. You don't pay another penny. $180 means 24 games and the hardware for you to use however else you want. Okay. Yeah, I like it. I mean, it's it's niche, but I think it's obviously going to find an audience, and I think just the novelty factor and uh, just the philosophy behind it, I think a lot of people will get behind. I'm pretty sure from a sort of mainstream perspective, people will be bulking at the price, though. But uh, I think for the kind of market that they're aiming for, it probably doesn't matter. I think nowadays, this is maybe the best time to sell a specific niche product at a limited quantity that gets sold out. I mean, goodness, they could just make this the shape of a sneaker and it would instantly sell out based on how the Internet economy works. But what I've tested, I've really enjoyed and felt like they really do get close to that value 
proposition. They have not they have not botched this at this point. If the other 20 games are trash, well, I'm sorry. But the first four, I mean, the way I say it is I think there will be at least four games out of the 24 that everyone will be delighted by. Everyone will be able to get at least four games out of that package. They go, oh, I couldn't have played that elsewhere. That was great. I'm glad. That's more than the Atari Jaguar. (laughs) (laughs) All right. (laughs) Well, it's very interesting, and I do encourage as always, people to go to our second account, read Sam's article on this because there's a lot more information there. There's more dev information there on who's uh, making games for this uh, beyond the ones we mentioned. And it's just uh, delightful to read anyway. And uh, I think uh, definitely John and I, uh, being the retro best buds to the channel, will probably mm-hmm. check out the play date. Yeah, as, I uh, think so. It comes out. And uh, I'm very excited for it. And as I said, I might even try my hand on making a game or two for it. Maybe it's an overhead RPG starring a bobcat wearing a t-shirt or something. I, don't know. <laughs> no, I hope not, but... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for it. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, enough about the play date. It looks awesome, and thanks, Sam, for bringing it on the show. Uh, but let's move on to the next topic. So, John, specifically John and I, have been asked several times on the Discord and on Twitter our opinions on... Final Fantasy Pixel Remasters. It has come out. The first three games have come out for this uh, new series. Uh, As the name suggests, it is a Pixel Remasters. It does bring back the old NES games and it does change a few things around. I've played uh, the majority of one and have things to say about it. But John, I know you also have things to say about it. So what's the scoop here? How do you feel about the actual release now on Steam and mobile? Well, there's there's multiple things here to say about this. First of all, the initial release, I would say, was relatively disappointing overall. There are good elements here that we'll talk about. But um, first of all, there's there's performance issues, for one, by default, where essentially the scrolling is not smooth. Uh, some people were in our Discord and others were doing some, some maths on this and kind of deduced that it's something like 38 frames per second update. But and there's been some workarounds people have come up with and other like sort of tricks that you can do to sort of obfuscate that. But by default, whether you're playing on the phone or on a PC via Steam, uh, it doesn't run correctly or it doesn't look smooth in motion. Uh, and it should be noted the original NES games all ran at 60 frames per second, you know, as they tended to back then. Uh, so that that was annoying, but it seems like that stuff is kind of getting worked on and improved uh, from the community. Also, uh, we, we talked previously about the font design and complained about this, in fact, that the fonts were very out of place. They were high resolution, uh, weird, weird proportions that didn't fit the artwork at all. Uh, this, too, appears to have been fixed via mods, uh, and you can actually inject different fonts into the game, and some people have come up with much nicer looking pixel fonts that actually kind of look like they fit the game basically. Have have we gotten so, wingdings modded in yet? That's my question. Can we really? No, just... but there was there, <laughs> there's some other very bizarre fonts that I've seen uh, as uh, just for fun. But the the good one out there is looking pretty nice. I must say. Yeah, I think it's the Chicago font. The yeah, people... something like that. The actual artwork looks pretty good, and most importantly, and I'll let you talk more about this. The actual soundtrack. Uh, is phenomenal. They did a really good job sort of updating this, I think. Uh, my initial impression as I bought uh, Final Fantasy 1 was uh, kind of like you. It was just like, oh, John, I don't think I feel too well. And then I kind of put it away. And then uh, very quickly, we should mod- we should really note that the modding community around this has been uh, incredible and uh, really taking care of most of the issues uh, right away. Of course, the font, one of the first things. Uh, and it's something we noted in that prior direct. Uh, but um, I want to note something about the graphics because this, I think, tends to come up as kind of like, hey, what do you think of these graphics? Because people will then bring up Wonder Swan, they will bring up PSP. Uh, the PSP especially then had uh, rework graphics to be more like 32 bit, 16 bit um, hybrid ish, new redesigns. I think what they're doing here is actually more interesting. Uh, because here they're taking the original source, but they're redesigning sprites to make sense on essentially 4K displays. They're cleaning up the art because original pixel art, uh, regardless of whether or not you drag out a PVM and play it today and whatever, for the most part, all games were designed with composite signal uh, with scan lines and uh, color bleed and all these things to create a sense of depth, to create detail that wasn't actually there. When you blow this up to 4K, 
they just look chunky and they can look weird and it kind of becomes messy. We actually encounter this a lot when we capture stuff uh, today. And it's it's kind of hit or miss, I'd say. The, yeah, it some, depends some on, art styles course. work very well like that. Like you blow up a Sonic game, they look awesome just as raw pixels, but Th- other games, less enough. so. Yeah, especially when you get to stuff like uh, the later Final Fantasies, which do trickery to uh, kind of uh, get a sense of depth. Like yeah, that's they, not going to They try to make more complex artwork yeah. uh, using sort of the video standards of the day. Right. So I think what they're doing here, rather than just porting over then new art from PSP or whatever, like because that, that's a reimagining, and that's that's fine, and you can still play that. And it's a actually a very good version. But here we're getting a sense of the original vision, but cleaned up for modern displays. And I think uh, the graphics actually have shown up before. They're in that FF dot book that I have over over there. Uh, but uh, I think this looks great, and I really actually enjoy the way this looks. And I think it translates the games that I remember from when I was a kid and gets those characters across in a new, clean way for modern displays. I'm a little blind on exactly where they're sourcing those designs from. Is it that they're going back to, say, the box art and instruction manuals from the Japanese versions in that original source art and redoing the pixels to fit that? Is it more just about saying, okay, that thing you remember from Famicom and Nintendo Entertainment System, let's make that look, let's take that idea and have it actually just pop correctly while still being pixelated? Like, I, I don't understand exactly the art direction. I think they're deriving it more from stuff on the Super NES, actually, and then sort of yeah, carry that back from to the like older FF4. games as well, right? Uh, they're basing these designs on the pixels themselves. They're not using like the Amano artwork because that's what the PSP essentially then does. Any version of an old game like that, it's the endless debate between folks like us who absolutely care about things like integer scaling and other proper representation and people who grab these games go that don't look right let me turn on bilinear filtering and then i just jump out the window so i don't know uh, for just on a market level who it is that they are reaching out to like do you think that they care about us ultimately with the vision and with and the representation or do you think they have a completely different consumer in mind uh i think this is uh, actually marketed more towards a Japanese audience, first and foremost, who then at this point are introducing their children to these older games and then making them uh, fit what they expect and remember. And then also something of a cleaner look that doesn't obscure too much for younger eyes. So from a Western demographic, I'm not really sure uh, if they thought about that. Obviously, the Square Enix USA office probably has some thoughts on this. But I think that's more just appropriating what's already there and saying, you know, Pixel Remasters doesn't look great. Like, I don't know if it's any deeper than that. And the other thing I think about is just we've it's been talked about ad nauseum, but the market decision to say the Steam version, that's where we're going first, which is so rare uh, for a Japanese developer in the past, you know, decade plus to say that's a, a lead platform as opposed to a certain port begged portable system. But uh, what a way to get feedback, though, on that engine. That's because, what I was uh, going to say, yeah. I yeah, think this key. I think this is uh, where the USA team comes in, is that this is an excellent way of not alienating a, a you know market share that most likely would not pick it up again, patch the game over and over. They probably will pick it up on a Switch card later on with whatever fixes they implement. And I think that's the reasoning for mobile and uh, uh, Steam is that it's a different audience, perhaps, in the, the majority of which that can bring some feedback. And then later on, I'm pretty sure I have no inside sources on this, uh, but uh, I am pretty sure eventually a console version will show up. Yeah. OK, so um, I'm not deeply invested in these old Final Fantasy games. So um, I've got two sort of points, takeaways from the discussion so far, both from you, John. First of all, um, 38 frames per second. Uh, How, why, what went wrong? And secondly, uh, relatively disappointed. Um, (laughs) Relative to what? Because surely you're either disappointed or you're not. Well, no, I say that because uh, there was aspects that were disappointing and then there was aspects that were surprising in a good way. So you could say that, you know, my expectations were actually a bit lower on the art side. And and then I was actually happier with that. Sorry, the 38 frames per second thing here. I've got, you know, I've got to pick you up on this because 
you can't put out a game that performs worse than 30 year old hardware you just can't how has this happened it doesn't seem to necessarily 40. be like an actual performance problem so much as something to do with however they're scrolling the screen or updating things. It seems to be built in Unity now, from what I can tell. And okay. it was discovered, oh, I wish I'm blanking on his name, but I was talking with somebody in the Discord that basically discovered it by playing around with different refresh rates on their monitor. And they kind of discovered that, you know, they were actually counting frames and looking at it. It's like, all right, at 60 hertz, you know, you're getting duplicates as you would expect. And they kind of figured out that if you kind of, use get hit like a 38 frame per second cap with the refresh rate configured correctly you can actually get smooth scrolling and it's kind of true uh but there's some other tweaks that people were doing to sort of like bump that up and actually get it to scroll correctly uh so i think it's probably just some sort of like setting in the way that they've built the game that's just causing this and this is actually a real problem with a lot of Unity projects, and I don't know why. And I've seen this in other... This is similar to the Alex Kidd problem that I mentioned a few weeks back. Remember where it was like basically updating at 50 hertz? Yeah. Well, the difference there is that there was a rational explanation. Sort of. <laughs> so so they, they've, they've even kind of maintained that, well, you know, it's like it is 50, but they haven't said specifically, oh, it's actually the PAL version, even though I think that's clearly what it is. But um, it's the same... And, and that's not the only game. There's been other games like this as well, but it's a very common problem with Unity titles from smaller developers where they have these weird arbitrary sort of like frame rate targets that cause a lot of weird judder uh, just by default. And I've understood that actually solving this in most cases is relatively simple, but it's something that's not being implemented. So it feels like it's something that's just not being caught. And I don't know why, but developers aren't picking up on it. It doesn't make me want to buy pre-buy all six in the collection. You know, you don't see this and go, well, that's $80 American. I'm ready to throw down right now based on that. That's that's it's it is trash, even though clearly the package has love in it. So it's almost like Square Enix has multiple teams on the cheap bolting this all together at the last minute. Someone in QA screaming a, a bloodstorm try and, and everyone else saying, eh, they won't notice. Just put it out like that. I can't help but think that that's it's a production issue as opposed to a technical one. I definitely agree with you that I think there's a mix of this where it's different philosophies and different care going into this because if you look at another area of the game, which is the audio, the music and the arrangements in this game is among some of the best in the series history. And uh, I forget who did it. I think it's uh, Murai Ayumi and uh, Noda Hirosato uh, who handled it and uh, with oversight from Uematsu, obviously. But uh, yeah, uh, the audio cannot be faulted here. It's uh, really, really good, like really good. So care is in the product, but it's definitely technically uh, lagging behind a bit. But there's always ways to fix that, I think. And perhaps they will very soon. Well, that was awkward. Well, we were waiting for you to cut uh, We were waiting for you to hum the, the, the <laughs> battle theme. That's the conclusion. <laughs> Rich, come on, give me the harmony. Yeah, the only, uh, I've, honestly, I don't, I don't have any... I didn't play these games to begin with, so I'm just kind of baffled that the concept that uh, these... I mean, it seems to be the case that whenever an old Final Fantasy game comes out again, there's something wrong with it. And... Yeah. Um, why does yeah. it? Why does this keep happening? I just oh, don't no. understand. Apparently, yeah, because pretty... uh, because people keep paying for it. Every <laughs> they, single they have a bad Enix classic this. keeps selling. Right. So they've done a lot of phone releases over the years, including just bringing Super NES games to the phones, and they always run terrible. There's always problems. Actually, uh, mentioning phone is the last point I think we'll bring up. Uh, I have not played this on mobile. Uh, but I saw some reports that uh, gamepad support on mobile is uh, not working at the moment. So it's yeah. all touch controls. I've seen a lot this, of people complain uh, about that as well. Yeah. And I mean, RPGs, it's it's not the worst. Uh, but still. Game, it's, it's, but it's accessibility. So, yeah. Accessibility matters. And some people can't <laughs> yeah. use touch screens. So. Absolutely. But I'm sure this is a, a compatibility issue and will be fixed. So I think we have mixed opinions. But I think on a... Um, you know, artistic level, I think this is a success. Uh, the music, especially, and then the graphics, I have no issue with. The backgrounds are lovely. Uh, there are quality of life up to, uh, to the game, which, you know, faster speeds. Uh, there's this uh, database thing you can uh, do. There's a lot of things they've added, uh, which I really appreciate. So it's uh, 
an okay product. Uh, and if it gets better, then I'll definitely say that uh, I think I like this. I, I hope I hope Square Enix shows up and asks for that for the box quote. It's an okay product. Sorry, it's all yes, right. I was relatively disappointed. Yes, I was relative relative, <laughs> yes. relative to the NES, I suppose. <laughs> All right, well, that's enough remastering on our thoughts here. Let's move on to the next topic. As we have our special guest, Sam, on the table today. Sam, you want to talk a little bit about VR. It's uh, in a state of, um, let's say, it's a lot of interesting talk because some people don't really know what's going on with VR. Others are very optimistic about it. Like Rich last week talked about the PSVR 2 and sounded uh, pretty optimistic for that direction. But Sam... What's your thoughts now on the state of VR? Well, I, I brought this up when we were chatting before the, the call because there was a post over at Reset Era that was one of these sort of anonymously sourced, not necessarily true things that actually I appreciated as a conversation. The allegations included that Quest software is outpacing Steam VR software so much that developers are focusing their attention more to the Quest platform than Steam VR and that PC VR is quote unquote dead. Uh, and there was also at around the same time, uh, there was a big recall of Quest headsets all over uh, North America following the similar delistings in Europe. Uh, and this was Facebook's first time to finally fess up and say that the mask linings that ship with Quest 2 uh, have certain contaminants that irritate faces. Essentially, the United States uh, regulatory boards that handle this stuff have a rule that you have to put on your box that something is an irritant if it's an irritant, if it's proven to at least create itching and hives and marks on your face, that has to be on the box. And so they finally couldn't say tiny percentage of users. They couldn't finally say, oh, we've improved our process. All of that hogwash had to go out the window and they had to say, yeah, we're recalling all the face masks. Oh, but in good news, we're going to increase the default storage on Quest hardware once it goes back onto store shelves uh, around uh, later, I think later this month in August. Uh, so those both sort of came at the same time of a Quest stuff is selling better, but is burning people's faces, which is always a fun way to, to kind of start that. Um, and I think it's interesting because here we are in 2021 and virtual reality has neither died nor become this amazing gargantuan. Everybody owns it, changing the industry in way. We're still in this weird hanging on point for virtual reality. And I've been covering VR at Ars Technica since it became a commercially viable. I remember one of the first Penny Arcade Expos that I went to where one of the Oculus people slapped the duct taped headset onto my face and I did the Doom 3 demo. I'll never forget it. It blew my mind. And at that point I said, this is happening. But here we are now where we all realize not everybody's strapping into VR, winging their hands around, slamming their televisions, breaking all their stuff and stomping on their cats, but it's also not dead. So I find that interesting that the perspective is, well, what are developers targeting? And if developers can't make as much money targeting the larger scaling power of PC VR, then that's not a small factor. That's actually happening. Of course, last week, uh, your conversation about PlayStation VR 2 uh, fed into what sounds like more information coming up publicly. Now, I'm on the outside of this. Whoever Rich knows on the deep, dark web, I am not in contact with. So some of this information is new to me. And now that's out in the public record, I can say it out loud and y'all can feign ignorance in terms of a wider field of view is expected for next gen VR, I believe is the, is the target name. It's something like that. Uh, also an HDR compatible display, which simply means, you know, brighter brights and deeper darks. Hopefully I, I want to say OLED for the panel, but I can't remember that for sure. Um, but essentially a lot of good sounding specs. But interestingly, the notes from this leak, and again, I don't have that source handy, so this could be all hogwash. But the, the conversation that I believe is that targeting for software is not VR exclusive. It is, hey, did you make a really epic game? Can we shoehorn virtual reality into it to make it really feel good? Then let's make sure that our big games have VR access so that you're not stuck developing for a, a platform that not everyone buys. Instead, you're going to entice people to, you know, tap into PlayStation 5 power and get that virtual reality mode. Oh, and the controllers, which have already been debuted. Sony's been, you know, vocal about a lot of P uh, PlayStation VR 2 stuff. Those will come in the box 
which makes sense, but that would be a first for Sony and VR. So that just being confirmed or, or that being on the table sounds very nice. So we have all that stuff side by side. I haven't necessarily made a point there other than to say people are still investing money in virtual reality, which excites me. I had family in town who had never used Valve Index just very recently and strapped two young boys into Star Wars squadrons on Valve Index and they lost their minds and their mom and dad are very mad at me. What can I say? I think um, it wouldn't surprise me if developers are targeting the Quest because, you know, they're shifting units fundamentally. And I think it's also a really good platform. But as I said last week, I think uh, Facebook are making a whole bunch of tactical errors here that are just infuriating. And I think it all started to go downhill with the Facebook ID login, which just turns me off the, the system. You know, it basically snuffed out interest I had in it personally. And then, as you say, there's the whole irritant thing, which, uh, you know, again, it's a, a sort of massive own goal. But I think they are the platform that is, you know, that, that is fundamentally shifting units, whereas on the PC side, things are starting to get how can you say it, moribund, you know, there's not much going on. It doesn't feel like there's any sort of inertia. And that is why I'm excited about uh, the next generation PlayStation VR, because it will, you know, give it a bit of a kick up the ass, you know, and, and start things moving again on a higher end platform. And uh, yeah, you know, I, last week I was talking about stuff that hadn't been revealed that, that excites me. And um, lo and behold, the stuff has come out and it is, you know, I've, I think we can confirm at this point it does have an HDR display, which I think is, you know, pretty awesome. And it shows says to me that Sony is moving um, VR in directions that nobody else is. And it's going to be on a mainstream platform that's, that you know, is, is just selling gangbusters. I think it's really exciting and maybe it's what we need. The really interesting thing to me is that PC VR could have been propelled in a huge way by Half-Life Alex, which is a VR only game. And Sony maybe has enough data to look at that and go, VR only games don't necessarily move the needle the way we might hope as people trying to sell a bunch of hardware. Sony is a hardware company. Uh, they need to make money off of that to some extent, whether they're attaching software licenses or not. So for them to come out and have anything that hints to these games have to be triple A with VR attached as opposed to VR only, I think is a giant repudiation of Valve's philosophy. And here, sure enough, you look at Valve Index, what really has blown that market open after Half-Life Alex? I would say nothing, certainly nothing that isn't also happening on Quest. Uh, and then on the other hand, I've got the phrase Facebooking of VR all over Google and people at Oculus I've heard do not like that I've done this uh, because it just makes me sick to this day. I've never been on the show before, but I'm very happy to say into a camera that attaching a uh, an account license to a computer monitor is trash, garbage, infuriating and trash. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think we all agree with that. By Ars Technica. <laughs> <laughs> Views and opinions are not of digital family. Yeah, put that on the box. Marketing quote. <laughs> <laughs> but John, you had a point to make there. I, I mean, does PlayStation VR 2 come into it? Do you think it is going to be moving the needle? I think we're in a spot where PSVR 2 could actually help move the needle back in terms of higher end experiences. But I think ultimately what people want, I think the quest shows that people want this standalone unit that you just put on your head and go around with. The problem though, is I don't think the quest is necessarily the one to pull it off. It is getting more market attention right now, but between the fact that it's not comfortable, uh, between the Facebook integration, between the still weak hardware, uh, I, I think it's like showing what we need to move towards, but it's not there yet. And some of that's just limitations of, of silicon and, and power draw and all this kind of stuff right now, right? Like doing standalone VR, it's hard. Um, but I think that's ultimately where we need to get to because that freedom you get from just having a unit without a cable is a big deal. And I'm a little, so I think, I think it's been determined that the PSVR 2 does use like USB-C to connect. Mm -hmm. They've they've confirmed that it'll connect, but with a wire, one and, cable. And maybe that's expecting too much from a product that needs to sell on a console. But I feel like if that had had wireless communication features with the PS5, that would have helped a lot in terms of just freeing people up. Even though you're still technically in the same room, just getting rid of the weight of the wire and the need to like worry about it when you're turning around is such a huge deal. Uh, but even still, the features and the specs sound interesting enough, and the PS5 is powerful enough compared to, like, obviously the Quest, 
that I'm still hopeful that it will drive high end VR as well as the mobile, you know, as well as allowing the mobile stuff to coexist as it continues to build up in terms of specs, because quite frankly, the quest is not good enough right now on its own to deliver the types of experiences that I would consider the best. I mean, and unfortunately things haven't changed that much since then, but half-life Alex and Boneworks are still probably my favorite too. Uh, and I don't think you could really do that on a quest right now. But isn't it the case that the Quest is also swiftly becoming the default PC headset? And it does have wireless support. No, you're completely right. It's just the problem there is still, you know, there's still limitations when tethering it to a PC. And beyond that, I mean, for me personally, at least, it's not comfortable. Uh, I don't, I can't wear it very long from from my testing. I I find it heavy, front heavy, like messing around with the different straps, like, it's it's the worst thing for me in terms of just being able to enjoy. I, I just feel like you, you constantly have to adjust it and fiddle with it, and it's never comfortable. Whereas, you know, I have the Rift S here as well, which is kind of, you know, outdated VR at this point, I suppose. But uh, it's actually really comfortable to wear, like the most out of all the headsets I've used. One of the things that Facebook did to save money on Quest 2 was make it only one panel instead of two panels and then create a really cheap uh, uh, IPD uh, interpupillary distance slider, which only works at three presets. My eyes are exactly between some of those presets, so I can't use Quest 2 without getting a headache. And there are a lot of other people, I think, out there who have that. But the thing about Quest 2 that is going to be a real bummer is when they realize that Facebook doesn't actually care as much about gaming as they look like. Gamers are great testers. We are essentially a QA market. As, as Quest 2 consumers, because what Facebook really wants to do, and Zuckerberg came out and said this in an interview, is that he's got he's obsessed with this concept of the metaverse. He wants Snow Crash as a Facebook product. He wants us all wearing glasses out in the world. And there have been things at different Facebook Connect and Oculus Connect events where they've talked about the Google Glass like device that they want you to wear that has a little bit of power that can do audio processing. So it actually eavesdrops on everything else around you in order to focus audio for you. You, which I don't think anybody in the in the cafe is going to sign the same TOS that a, a user is, is using. So that's its own conundrum. But my, I do think that I fear Facebook saying, actually, we got what we need. We're out. Thank you for testing all this stuff. You paid less than the hardware was worth because we needed that data, all that biometric feedback of how you use it in order to build the next thing. So that's a real bummer that while it's leading and while developers sh- developers in the short term, short term are getting VR gamers in the long term, Facebook has a much bigger play of its own crazy OS. And maybe they'll pull it off because people are so hooked on Instagram and WhatsApp and whatever else Facebook acquires that they can pull that off. But that's why I, as the American rep on the show, am really hoping that regulars pay attention to what they're doing, squishing all this together and how the Oculus piece of that puzzle really talks about personal data in a way that other services don't necessarily do. I think uh, I think you know on a more global scale the main issue is just that fundamentally uh, a big sort of headset based gaming platform is uncomfortable. Doesn't matter how good I think the headset is it's just not, you know. I think you know I always like VR to Cyclops's headset for Marvel Comics uh, sorry for Cyclops's visor for Marvel Comics. So in the 60s it was this big hulking thing that you know looked pretty unwieldy. And then in the 90s, he was kind of like wearing red Ray-Bans. And to actually sort of make VR palatable to most people, we need to be in the 90s Ray-Ban phase. And uh, these big kind of hulking headsets, I think, are just a fundamental turnoff. It becomes more of a novelty. It's something that you can only wear for short periods of time, which limits the, the, the scope of the games you're going to be able to make. And, um, you know, I still have motion sickness issues with uh, with VR. Uh, Same. I, I can't play them. And I, I've actually produced three VR titles for uh, PSVR. <laughs> And, uh, you know, testing them, helping the development on them. I still, you know, they're pretty slow moving games for VR. Uh, they're not bone works or anything, but I get motion sickness. Uh, the uh, Quest 2 is the only, I played at the John's Place and it did help a little bit. Uh, I got less sick from that, I remember. So I have hopes that the PSVR uh, gets better. But yeah, you're totally right, Rich. It's kind of a novelty when you have to essentially become Robocop every time you want to play a game, right? You have to put the helmet on and yeah, well, uh, sixty cycles. Uh, just, uh, yeah, I I really uh, do I really do believe that Sony is in a position with 
uh, brand recognition and with good game design on PSVR one to say, OK, we got it. This is the best sit down, strap in Robocop option you're going to get at a price that's not insane. I think that they can take the learnings from what's good about Valve Index, build on that with their side of uh, of R&D and make something that might make Rich feel a little better. Now, that may not totally change his mind and not, may not make VR the thing that everyone straps into Matrix style. But if anyone's going to do it outside of Facebook, I do think Sony understands what it means to be comfortable for long periods of time. And if that fit is good and if the screen is good and the field of view is good and the refresh is good, I think they're in a good position to get us 12 months from now saying a whole different tune. Now, that doesn't mean they're going to succeed, but I think they're in a position to answer many of what Rich, many of Rich's concerns. Yeah, I mean, what I haven't heard from my uh, quote unquote dark net sources is this concept of um, VR being a kind of addition to an existing AAA title. Um, but I can kind of see it happening because, you know, basically with um, developers targeting 4K displays, that's a lot of GPU power being deployed to a lot of pixels that could be redirected to a stereoscopic 3D uh, VR display instead. So I can definitely see that happening. I would be kind of um, interested to, to, to see that, see how that's going to work out. But, you know, there are titles that people have happily played through, AAA, you know, in full VR. I guess the, the sort of standout one being Resident Evil 7. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what Sony have got on, uh, to offer. And I think in terms of the hardware side of things, uh, nothing I've seen on the spec so far says to me that they've made a step wrong. It's looking really strong. And I guess we just have to wait and see how the official announce is going to uh, play out, what titles there are going to be, um, and whether they stick with OLED, which I hope they do. I don't think that has been confirmed one way or the other yet, but uh, I guess we'll see. Also, now I'm newly upset that Resident Evil 7 is still not on PC VR. So thanks. <laughs> thanks for opening that wound. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, guys, let's wrap this up. We hope, of course, in the future that Rich will have less strap on issues. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be the season of uh, return unexpected returns and uh, expected uh, results uh, based on some of the uh, last weeks we've seen. But uh, apparently... 3D FX is coming back. The old provider of uh, graphics cards, uh, apparently not providing graphics cards. Maybe in the future, John. What's this all about? Yeah. So this this thing is confusing. Essentially, basically, a, a 3D FX official Twitter account opened up. Essentially, sort of like teasing the return of this. And obviously, Nvidia had purchased 3D FX in the past, right? So, um, but the. Today, they put up some sort of a statement saying Janssen Products is proud to announce that 3DFX is returning. It's a new investment company in San Francisco that acquired the assets of 3DFX on July 23rd. <laughs> and it's in the process of trademarking the name. Uh, and they're scheduled to return this winter with new graphics cards and will expand into other products, etc., etc. And I'm just like... When when that statement went out, I'm just like, oh, okay, this is this is either like just they have no idea what they're doing, they're just joking around, or it's something like, oh, um, we're just gonna buy the 3D FX name and slap it on some cheap already existing products and try to make some stuff off of that while cashing in on the uh, the name, I guess. Like I, I because I mean fundamentally like gpu design is such a competitive and extremely challenging field you can't you can't just you can't just walk in here like yeah we're gonna make cutting edge pro like maybe in the 90s you could kind of do that but now like you're not you're not doing that it's not happening oh we all did it in the 90s but that's not where we're at now <laughs> no. so like you know you can't come with the bubster card and you know launch anything you have to have billions in research and years to compete with uh, AMD and then like Nvidia on top of that? Can, can I offer talent. my com can I offer my completely uneducated guess? We're going to all get it. emails in two months. That's mo all I do. We're going to get emails in two months about this brand new blockchain technology that's going to not get through any of our spam filters. It's going to be a blockchain scam is sort of my uneducated guess. But yeah, good, good luck, 3DFX. The announcement mentions smartphones and this immediately, actually, there's a very good video out now by Nostalgia Nerd that goes through the Commodore trademark being used for uh, smartphones, the Commodore Pet and the Commodore Leo. And uh, that video goes through kind of like seeing an opening with a 
famous trademark, getting it, putting it on some sort of Chinese, you know, made to bulk order hardware. And this seems similar to that, where you can kind of get some cheap uh, cell phone, Android, put the logo on it, and then you, there you go. I'm, t- I'm waiting for the, Z- the ZX Spectrum phone, you know, that's specifically capped to its palette. And yeah, let's let's go back to uh, to all my favorite uh, rare games when they were ultimate play the game. Yeah, perfect. Whenever anybody mentions the Spectrum, I'm remembering an EGX panel that, that we did where there was a guy just sitting in the audience shaking his head at everything we oh, had yeah. to say about the Spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> he was very unhappy with me because I said uh, Spectrum isn't very good. It's actually trash. And that guy just folded his arms he, and sat like he gave you the death glare as he shook his head. I'm yeah, surprised you managed to walk out of there, to be honest. But we did survive. Uh, I did get the flu though, uh, so <laughs> true. maybe he like sent that my direction. Well, I just I just love this tweet uh, simply because you know the concept of uh, you know um, I'm sort of reminded of the lyrics of Craig David's Seven Days, you know meeting up on Monday, making a GPU on Tuesday, <laughs> making love on Wednesday, uh, chilling on Sunday, uh, you know, the whole sort of nine yards, really. But, uh, Bankruptcy on Friday. <laughs> but uh, I think uh, NVIDIA owns the IP for 3DFX. They may not own the, the 3DFX name. Um, but just this, you know, uh, a while back, um, I actually had a, a meeting with Raja Kaduri who was talking about the... Uh, challenges of making new gpus for intel and um <laughs> essentially it takes five years to make a gpu from scratch you know a gpu architecture and uh, i just love the <laughs> i love the idea of 3d fx rolling up <laughs> you know okay it's july we'll have some new gpus in five months <laughs> yeah so we we just bought the the trademark let's uh let's get started gents yeah. get this oh, out for maybe, christmas maybe they teamed up with captain's workshop <laughs> oh, oh, oh yes got, got the voodoo 5 9 000. The vo- if they make the voodoo 5 9 000 a reality then i you know I'm looking forward to Digital Foundry buying up another lapsed uh, gpu brand and seeing if you can beat the new 3d fx to market i think that'd be a fun race <laughs> which one would that be well you know what or you know what i would be okay if this like hey we're actually like a retro company and we're going to be reproducing classic 3d effects cards uh for yeah no that's not going to work is it <laughs> that'll, that'll sell to about 27 very very prolific youtube accounts that b- exactly. put things into old pcs who are all in our discord yes <laughs> well uh i think we said enough about this uh i guess it will we'll see what happens I just got my Steam code for Zool. You guys ready to get redimensioned? Yeah, I'm pretty excited about this. Uh, it looks great. It's done by the uh, new Sumo. Uh, what's it called? Stu- uh, student Studio? The Academy. Academy, yeah. Student Academy. And uh, it looks great. Looks like a pretty good uh, remaster of Zool. So uh, we totally support this kind of effort, teaching uh, younger developers to uh, build a game and ship it with... Uh, prior existing ip it's great prior existing lead better approved ip is what i hear uh, i have the mean machines issue to approve that's right it. okay yeah um <laughs> on screen right now <laughs> well what, you know I, I do like the way you sort of dig out 28 year old reviews uh, rich that, uh, that i may not have written, now. I have I may not have written in the first place <laughs> for every occasion i have a folder it's just it's called rich. Yeah, it's kind and of silly. Happy really. rich, sad rich, mm-hmm. enticed rich, angry rich. <laughs> mm-hmm. Angry rich is uh, the most full folder. That's thirty-two gigabytes. I was gonna say, is that the <laughs> is that the same face icon on each of those folders? Yes, it's just a disapproving rich. Got it. <laughs> All I will say is that I think uh, established developers who build sort of farm uh, efforts that legitimize. Uh, students moving into production. Uh, it reminds me of when Nintendo kicked off NST, Nintendo Nintendo Software Technology, uh, and uh, some of their games, the the March of the Mini series, uh, the Wave Race Blue Storm sequel for GameCube, were phen- uh, Ridge Racer sixty four, I believe they worked on that. So when I think that's that sort of stuff, that's the thing about the Zool uh, re release that that gets me at least perks me up from a game history perspective, whether Sumo's in a position to make that machine uh, productive and really work for those students, you know, give them good experience and good compensation and all those sort of things. I don't know. But, you know, if Zool makes them giant stars, then so be it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It happened before. It can happen again. 
That's right. People did love Zool back in the 90s. And Zool 2 did exist in the Atari Jaguar. It certainly did. Is that one of the four good uh, Atari games? Uh, Jaguar games? No. Okay. No. <laughs> Was it just like, you know, the final sunset for the franchise? The Jaguar sequel? Pretty much. <laughs> Uh, well, thank, it was thankfully, on Amiga 3 too. As the, well. This this CD. new version here, and it does remind me that it actually has like legitimate backgrounds. Like the problem with Zool 2, I found is that they it, it suffered from the same thing that a lot of UK platformers did, like James Pond as well, where they just like put random objects in the background and sort of parallax it. Like it's not like normally when you play a platform game, you expect to see like hills or like a city or something in the background that makes sense. But there was so many games that would just have like it's literally like a wall, a tiled wallpaper of like fruit, or like candy, or like lawnmowers, or you know, <laughs> just just stuff that doesn't make any sense. And it's just that's the background, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> so this doesn't have that. I, I definitely encourage everyone to go over to the Steam page, check out the trailer. It has very good uh, arranged music from the original, and then also check out that second video where they introduce the students that have been working on this. Because any effort to get young people to feel comfortable coming into the games industry, giving them a property that has established mechanics and foundations that they can work on and then improve with their sensibilities. Uh, this is amazing stuff. So we joke about Zool, but I think what Sumo is doing here is uh, among the best things you can do in the games industry for young people coming into it. So gentlemen, we are going to talk a little bit about the content we put out last week and a little bit of this. Uh, the flight sim uh, coverage has been very popular for us, and I know John, Alex, you talked a lot about it, uh, Rich as well on the last direct. A lot to say. Quickly though, I just want to hear, Sam, what's your kind of take on the console versions of uh, Microsoft uh, Flight Simulator? Your team does a fantastic job with exactly this kind of content, where it has PC heritage scaling down to a console and showing what has changed, what is what makes it still performative, where does it kind of lose stability, where does it kind of hold up? Uh, and, and Flight Simulator is tricky because it's so huge, because their entire algorithmic engine has to grab data from all over the world in case anyone decides I live in this town or I used to live in this city and I want to fly over it. Uh, I mean, in the earliest coverage, I did this where I, I was raised in Dallas, Texas, and the very earliest models of that city were just blurry with a couple of generic buildings. And those have been souped up a little bit. They've gotten a little bit better in those random regions on whatever platform you play to look more like where anything is programmatically grabbed with that mix of Bing data, uh, enough where VFR, visual flight rules can kick in. Because the idea is wherever you start flying, you should be able to make out just enough city uh, landmarks and geographic landmarks and get where you're going. Uh, and just on the technical level, just the fact that we are getting at 30 frames a second at the resolution targets that they've chosen and at the LOD targets they've chosen blows my mind. And I really enjoyed the interview you all had with a Sobo where they broke down what was done. Uh, like HTML efficiency as one of the pieces of that puzzle. I just I started laughing right when Alex did because that's incredible. Um, and beyond that, it's just the worst part is that a Sobo does not know how to make console interfaces. It's a real struggle to manipulate things in a way that's good for a gamepad. But on the flip side, they also took a game that should never work on a gamepad and gave you a one click joystick option to at least manipulate menus when you don't own a giant you know, throttle, rudder and all of those other pieces. I still ultimately think that what they did is phenomenal in terms of being a game pass. Because I think you guys talked about the technical side. I just think of the business side where the the ability for anyone to look at Game Pass and say, oh, Fight Simulator, I would never buy that, but sure, I'll give it a go. And they can dive in and it works. You have this really nice interface that says, well, this part of the interface is nice, at least that here's the landmark flights, the places you can go that are curated and built beautifully. You want to go over the pyramids. You want to go over Manhattan. We have those options laid out and, and if made efficient so you can truly bliss out in those moments as a virtual pilot. So I think that's a phenomenal success. And then assuming Game Pass and game streaming really sync up in ways that people can play on their just television sets without an Xbox, Flight Simulator, I think, is a real ace in their sleeve of saying, this is only 
on Xbox, only on the Xbox branded subscription service because of Bing and because of Azure and all these other proprietary things. I, I still cannot believe that Bing Maps has actually made something good. And that's what Flight Simulator is to me. Yeah, I've got two points to make about Flight Simulator. The first is um, uh, there's a certain barrier for entry on on this game because it is so demanding, right? So my dad really loves uh, the old Flight Simulator and he's still got a really old PC and there's just no way in hell that he's ever going to be able to experience that title the way it should be experienced. And um, so basically, you know, he could get a £250, uh, $299 Series S have a great time with it. Or, and this is quite an interesting point that Sam made, the concept of it being a streaming experience, it's not a title that strictly um, requires super low latency. It's kind of more sedate. It could actually be a really good streaming experience as well. Uh, the second point I want to make is, uh, I, you know, it hasn't had the love I think it deserves, but Alex's interviews, tech interview with the, with the Sobo studio, there is so much gold in there that I'm surprised other outlets haven't picked up on the fact that, you know, part of the key optimization drives for Flight Simulator on PC and for console was to was to optimize the inbuilt web browser. It's just it's just mind bending. It's nothing to do with the rendering. It's to do with the with the interface that they're using. You know, there's all manner of crazy stuff in there. And uh there was a sort of almost haunted look on the developer's face when he was talking about having to take ownership of the code that wasn't theirs. And, you know, there's code in there that goes all the way back to 1995. So, you know, that's that's it's an incredible story. So I do highly recommend checking that out. And I want to point to that transparency about the entire pipeline, I think is really a major trickle down for the past five, seven, however many years Phil Spencer has been running the Xbox ship. That whole thing from the developer talking to the PR group that says, yes, developers, you can talk about this stuff is a fan gamer technology first, transparent, open in love with the industry kind of attitude. That is huge to me. And if you want to see where Microsoft is truly going, I don't think it's necessarily the game release schedule as much as it is those those kind of gems, those little moments, I think give me a lot of confidence about Xbox just as a full machine of game lovers. I don't have much to say about it other than, you know, I joke a lot about being part of you, but uh, it's coverage like this when I look at what John, Rich and Alex did here with Flight Simulator and the interview, of course, I have to pinch myself sometimes just how talented this entire group is. And uh, yeah, it's been fantastic just watching each of these videos and how informative it is. Uh, I think I've learned more from Alex's videos lately than I have ever before about technology and games. So uh, it's just fun as a fan even to see all this. Take that, college. Yeah, no. <laughs> there was a reason I dropped out. <laughs> uh, also this week, uh, we did release the next DF Retro for Public. It's uh, Super Star Wars, the trilogy. It's much more so than that, though. It is also kind of the state of Star Wars from 1983, circa, to 1994, 95. I've gotten a lot of feedback on this, John, and I'm very happy with it. People are calling it among our bests. And uh, how do you feel quickly about this? Uh, why do you think people react so strongly to this episode more so than others? I don't know. I mean, Star Wars always resonates with people for one, but uh, it does kind of feel like we're just really getting starting to really refine these retros into almost like a science presenting a nice collection of both tech information as well as historical relevancy within the industry and just kind of also transporting people back to a different time and taking them through it. And I feel like in this case, it really is kind of a journey from uh the last star Wars film and how it ended up becoming super star Wars, like the whole, the video game journey and not just video games either. Like also like, you know, the extended universe stuff and all that really sort of took off during that period. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was really happy with how the presentation turned out and I'm, I'm surprised and happy that other people have enjoyed it so much. So 
I'm very uh, happy about that. I, I want to point real quickly to the fact that I sat and watched that with family. I had a, I mentioned already a couple of young boys in town and we all three sat on the couch and watched the entire thing. And those boys are uh, Star Wars fans and gaming fans. And I had given them a uh, modded Super Nintendo classic when they were younger with the Super Nintendo Star Wars games slapped onto it. And they were transfixed because you guys set that stage. It's it, for anyone who I assume anyone who's watching this has seen it but those who haven't it's very kid friendly because it really does explain a lot of what came before that context about nes games and then it also even has a very limited scope so it doesn't go on forever star wars you can talk about all day but you guys actually managed to do that combination of wide scope and narrow focus so good job df uh that actually makes me a little bit emotional hearing that but uh yeah from a writing standpoint i i know people love time capsules and i wanted to fully illustrate where Star Wars was at and also how important video games was to the resurgence of Star Wars because Timothy Zahn's novels uh, definitely spearheaded the return but there was the video games for people like me that then brought us fully back into that machine that would become Star Wars up until uh, Phantom Menace and then the special edition of VHS of course. So uh, it was a lot of fun to write. I'm very happy that people are watching it with family like you and uh, of course kids will love rich as yoda i mean how could you not absolutely we, 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 we've, beaten, we've beaten disney at their own game here i did enjoy filming the uh, the end piece the epilogue yes um, you got to live out a fantasy of your own what do you mean it's reality that's true <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you for using your force powers to also resurrect me uh, it was a scary <laughs> scary time that is uh, basically the, the whole promise of the dark side it's what uh, caused anakin to turn well, i now know the power sir I will not challenge you again. <laughs> well, before we go into our next segment, though, we do have a slight surprise. That's right. A new segment it is Sam Gets Rich. Here comes the money. Here we go. Money talk. Here comes the money. That's right. Uh, welcome to a special round that I like to call Sam's Rootin' Tootin' Big America Cowboy Lightning Round of Questions. Yeah! Yeah! Oh, no. This is a series of questions directed straight at Rich. Take as seriously or as silly you want. Some of them are straight from the heart. Some of them are straight from the butt. Let's go. Here we the very first question. When, Rich, can we expect a digital foundry res retrospective in print, complete with flipbook sequences to show off frame rate differences between Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3 versions of games? A print version? Wow, I don't know what to say about that. Um, I, well, I don't know. I'm up for it. I, I have a big print background. I love the concept of print. And um, whether we can actually pull it off, who knows? <laughs> you can then count the by eye, just like you do. Yeah, VRR. absolutely. Yeah, we I want to see duplicate flip, frames flip, flip frame pacing. Du literally duplicating the page. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be perfect. All right, next one, lightning round. It's the 20th anniversary of Xbox this year, and that makes me want to ask, is there a company out there today that you could imagine shoving its way into the game space that nobody sees coming, kind of the way Microsoft did that long ago? Um, I don't think they'd want to. I think it's everything is just too homogenized and too um, too established at the moment. I can't see anybody sort of breaking the existing. Uh, what, what would you call it? A triumvirate of platform holders plus mm -hmm. PC. It's really difficult. I think you're. Uh, sort of uh, that's the wrong answer. The answer is KFC. Next question: What's the first game you pirated as a child? Wow, it's going to be something on the spectrum, isn't it? Um, I knew it. Of course. Possibly, yeah, because yeah, I did have the ZX81, which uh, which obviously there was a great deal of piracy surrounding that at the time. But I don't think anybody else I knew had one, so it was all sort of Spectrum related. Um, but no, nah, I can't. I can't picture it. I can't picture which one it would be. Sorry. If anyone wants to come up with a fake answer, by all means, buzz in. All right, next question. I'll put a game on screen. Perfect. What is the <laughs> dumbest swag you have ever received from a game publisher? Um, I'm, I'm, okay, so here's, I can tell you the, the thing that sort of sticks in my mind is um, during the SNES era, um, some of my colleagues actually received a bribe of Swish Lamborghini jackets. When I say received, they were offered a bribe of Swish Lamborghini jackets to promote a game. 
And this one just sort of sticks in my mind as like, you know, what? Why? What's all this about? Lamborghini jackets? How? Why? That's that's kind of the one that's, that springs to mind. Um, but, you know, the kind of uh, sort of swag we get. Uh, these days, it's quite muted, isn't it? It's not, not nowhere near as... Uh, You've been around long enough where I assumed history. you'd seen some sillier stuff, yeah. Um, well, you know, it's kind of more events-driven, I guess, the ones that really sort of uh, uh, sort of come to mind. There was the time where, for some reason, AMD held... You remember the Hawaii graphics trip, um, graphics card? They actually did the, the press trip for that in Hawaii, which uh, <laughs> which is kind of like... So un AMD, I just can't believe that happened. And uh, I guess the other one was um, wasn't there like a, a Sony one or a, a, I can't remember if it was a God of War or Dark Souls or something where there were dead animals there. That was... <laughs> oh goodness! Oh. <laughs> I hope that was a natural also got swag. The MK Champagne. Well, of course, yeah. Um, Acclaim back in the day were quite ostentatious with their with their <laughs> gifts, and I do still have the uh, the Mortal Kombat Champagne. I'm sure it's eminently drinkable. If any of you guys want it, I feel like you have to saber that with a spine instead of a sword. So, next question: When Hollywood <laughs> makes the Digital Foundry biopic, which actor should play the role of Richard Ledbetter? Well, I'm going to have to take on the role for myself. I mean, that's <laughs> oh, right. I'm vetoing that and nominating Nicolas Cage. Next question. On the basis of history, quality and accessibility, what are the first video games you would recommend a young child start with as they begin the hobby? Wow, this is deep stuff. Um, it's got to be something simple, isn't it? I think, you know, I started out basically with Space Invaders. It's a good place to start, right? Love it. Next, why does Digital Foundry have a bias both for and against Nintendo, Microsoft, and Sony all at the same time? Um, that's an interesting question. I think only the most deranged members of our audience could possibly answer it. Uh, it's kind of like a selective bias because you basically, you know, if we say something bad about PlayStation, you've got to actually go out of your way to ignore all of the great stuff we've said about it. And it's same for Xbox. Uh, and all the others. It's a fascinating phenomenon, though, I have to admit. All right, and final question. If you were ever forced to cosplay to attend a conference, which gaming character would you dress as? And you have to do this. You cannot skip this conference. Um, wow. Um, are you aware of any character that dresses like me? That would be, that would be, <laughs> that would be the easiest Cosplaying solution. is going out of your comfort zone. Cosplay is not dress up like you're working at uh, Starbucks. But what if there is no comfort zone? <laughs> you just never come. <laughs> All right. Well, I look forward to Audi slapping on an outfit for you since you didn't choose one yourself. Oh, I, I have to choose for you. And uh, I guess uh, you'll only find out after this goes up on YouTube and cannot be taken down again. Well, I guess basically, if you know, if if I have to be sort of pushed into a corner here, anything with a complete mask, I think Vader might be quite appropriate. All right, yeah. Well, well, actually, I was going to say Palpatine then. I mean, why not just get the hood on? Yeah. Her. Accept the role that you're born to play. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> Doctor Doom. I've played, based, oh, yeah, based yeah. my entire life and vocabulary on his teachings. <laughs> so, yeah. That seems like a fitting end for Sam's Root and Tootin' Big America Cowboy Lightning Round of Questions. Yeah! <laughs> I can understand now why there's a US travel ban. <laughs> Oh, goodness. All right, guys, that's enough questions. Let's move on to the Q&A here. This one comes from... Oh, now I have to read, Rich. This is the scary part. This one comes from Devin Parker. If a game uses normal rasterization and isn't using something like DLSS or other AI has features, are NVIDIA's Tensor cores basically sitting idle or would they function like one of the CUDA cores? Also, if they're idle... Would AMD's approach of not having dedicated on silicon hardware for things like ray tracing be one of the reasons for taking that path? Or do you think that the choice was more of a budgetary restraint? Hope this makes sense and the coffee hasn't been kicked in yet. Uh, I can take this one. It's actually, I think he's answered his own question there because um, uh, fundamentally, yes, uh, the tensor cores will be sitting there doing absolutely nothing if there isn't an AI workload like DLSS. Um, but the point is that I think NVIDIA are trying to basically harmonize what they're trying to do in the enterprise space with what they're doing in gaming, which does mean, you know, obviously they saw an opening with AI, which is paying off for them massively 
uh, in the sort of server market. And um, they thought to themselves, well, you know, we want to harmonize our designs. How do we bring it to gaming? And it was a slow start with DLSS. But, you know, I think it's paying off now. Um, and, but it, you know, talking about what AMD are doing, that's exactly, you know, what he's saying there is exactly their approach there, which is to say that they don't want silicon sitting there idle. So they've kind of integrated the ray tracing hardware um, and the machine learning components into the main shaders. So in terms of um, efficiency of area, then the AMD approach is better. But actually, obviously, when it comes to producing uh, ray tracing or AI workloads, it's a severe disadvantage, as we've seen. So yeah, I think possibly the AMD approach might have been shaped a bit by um, uh, the next generation consoles. I mean, um, sounds like a crazy thing to say, but, you know, John, uh, the Microsoft event last year, I mean, um, uh, the architect for Xbox was talking to AMD about what they wanted from the silicon, uh, like before I saw Xbox One X. So this is, you know, again, how long a GPU takes to, to architect and create. And what Microsoft, what Microsoft wanted was extreme value from a limited amount of silicon, which is why we're seeing um, uh, NVIDIA with you know bigger silicon budgets on ray tracing and AI workloads uh, getting more performance. It's, you know, that's the way it is. So, you know, two different approaches, uh, two very different results. Uh, this comes from SB. When things like Playdate, ZX Spectrum, Next, Evercade, and all other remakes of retro consoles on the market are coming out in their future, do you see an option for DF to look more into alternative hardware going forward alongside the GPU and CPU reviews we're all, we already see? John. I mean, I kind of feel like we already do this to a degree. Not like, you know, in a dedicated fashion, but, you know, whenever a new piece of hardware comes along that interests me, I do like to look at it, so... You know, I've done a lot of those retro consoles. I've did an Evercade video. I've looked at the analog products. Uh, I want to look at stuff like Playdate. I've looked at Mister. You know, all, when that stuff hits, you know, if it if it if it looks interesting or pe enough people are curious about it, absolutely, I'll do a video on it. You know, and it's it is kind of a fun change of pace to do so. Uh, and then yeah, I mean, you know, har hardware is fun, also because you get to shoot a lot of B roll. And, you know, I, I do have a good time uh, busting out the camera gear to get, try to get some cool shots. So <laughs> y'all have a pretty good pipeline when it comes to taking uh, off ca off screen a capture. And, for example, taking something like Playdate, which does not dock into a television and y doing that frame rate analysis like you guys are kind of particularly po poised to talk about that stuff in ways that other uh, channels might not necessarily. Oh, sure. I mean, off screen frame rate. That's something we've done before. And none of us love doing it, but it's it is terrifying. possible. Yeah, <laughs> it literally involves counting frames, just going through frame by frame and and marking it up. It's uh, it's very tedious. That's how we did it for Switch before we had the portable capture units. Um, I think if there's a good story behind it, and if there's something genuinely new and interesting, um, I'm all for it. And uh, John does an amazing job of it. And uh, yeah, just fundamentally the production values, and um, you know, basically making hardware look as good as it can be. You know, I think that's something that John does really, really well. And uh, I love the CRT shots uh, in DF Retro. They're, they're a highlight for me. And, you know, the CRT stuff you did with the FW900 with the PlayStation 5 and Series X. Oh, yeah, awesome exactly. as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. All right. Next question comes from Ari Joel Cruzel. I've seen a tweet about how the Zelda Wii U tech demo looks better than actual Zelda games. Can you explain the differences on a video between uh, Breath of the Wild and this demo? I think what people are seeing and possibly confuses folks is just, um, so you look at that demo and it looks very attractive. There's no doubt about it, the Wii U demo. But a lot of that just comes down to the art direction more than anything else. And the fact that it's a very, it's a singular scene, a very carefully scripted scene designed to look a very specific way. But if you actually break down the rendering, it's not doing anything. That's like, especially like incredible or new. It, it looks very much of its era. I mean, you have a nice planar reflection, which is cool. Uh, nothing special there though. You know, you have, uh, decent normal map textures, you know, some nice self-shadowing and shadow maps from the windows and such. 
uh and it, there's a but there's a lot of baked lighting as well and, and like that over intense bloom it's got fake light shafts rather than like you know proper volumetrics i mean this is the wii u we're talking about right so it's not like they were going to do it looks amazing for what the wii u could offer but it's very much technology rooted in that era of things and so breath of the wild is also a wii u game right like it exists on switch but it's a wii u game fundamentally um it's also an open world game and i think in some ways artistically i might argue i kind of like breath of the wild more but I, I see why people might prefer what's in this wii u demo but at the same time it's not that much more detailed than some of the big temple areas you would see in that yeah. and also this comes down to artistic direction yeah it doesn't come down to like the technology so much mm. exactly so you know I mean, they 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 show a fly through the demo. They show it at night as well, and they've got like you know, Navi is like the light source, but it's just a regular old point light. There's nothing really going on there. And it, but the fact that Breath of the Wild is an open world game—that's the key, right? It's a large scale game, a huge seamless environment, and they were trying to do that on the Wii U. Uh, you know, you can't expect exactly to match this level of like just geometric detail necessarily. I think in a game like that versus a tech demo. The other thing is that this isn't just about the visuals. Uh, the thing that makes Breath of the Wild special is the whole systemic aspect of it. The way that everything kind of works, the way that people are able to experiment with uh, the systems within the game. It's tied into the visuals, but it's all about the, the gameplay and uh, the fact that they were able to make this happen on a Wii U, I would say, is borderline miraculous. And um, I guess the other thing, of course, is um, why wasn't this tech demo uh, spun out into an actual game? I mean, I think it's pretty clear that the reason is that after the reception of Skyward Sword at the time, which I, I like it, by the way, it's a good game, especially on the Switch. Uh, it was pretty clear that Nintendo needed to rethink Zelda. And they did that with Breath of the Wild. I think people were tired of that old formula. And this demo looks very much derived from that old vision of what a Zelda I guess you could say sort of based on Ocarina of Time would look like on that class of system um, and so yeah they clearly said okay well we're going in a different direction the thing about uh, Breath of the Wild when I, I, I can't remember which year it was at GDC but somebody from Nintendo's uh, Breath of the Wild team came out and basically said we started gray boxing a remake of the original 1987 Legend of Zelda and I think that was the year I'm, I might get that wrong with the disc system version, but also uh, kind of going from that top down view and sort of saying, well, how can we recreate those moments? So if anything, that means starting on a technical level with an outdoor camera from top down, which you don't get from that Wii U demo necessarily. So I think that can be the beginning of why that would branch out in a different direction where the developers were inspired by Skyrim. But then also when you're talking about being able to uh, change the world so dynamically, then that's a CPU budget that you have to account for that you don't on a Wii U demo. So that's but you're also talking ultimately about, you know, artistic direction choices for some of the things about whether it was possible on Wii U or not. You look at this demo, the rendering here, it's not really anything super amazing, right? It's just the art that makes it shine. It's a cool looking sequence. It was shown in real time on the Wii U, uh, but there's nothing here that's like, you know, wow, how come we never got that? It, it kind of reminds me of when uh, the 3DS was revealed and you got like the Metal Gear Solid 3 demo that was shown on that thing, which looked significantly better than what actually shipped. And again, that but that I think that was literally just like, well, here's what we can do if we dedicate a team to making a little demo and they can pour all this time and effort into getting the details right versus, OK, now we have to make this the whole game. And that original game is huge. So cl it's clear that they weren't able to go back and redo all of the assets or anything like that. So did this demo ever appear in, in the uh, Nintendo Giga Leak? Or is it still No, I don't think so. I no. don't think it did. Not so yet. I think, no. I think one of the Not thing yet. about these one of the things about these tech demos is that um once you actually get to see it directly and hands on, you become acutely aware of the limitations. Whereas when you're just seeing it in B roll, it can look absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, in its original form it used the gamepad. Uh, so you could like switch between t the time of day, you can mess around with the camera, but it was ultimately just a scripted sequence where you watch Link walk into the room and fight a big spider boss and, you know, that's that's it. So and it's easy to make. No, it's not easy to make. I would say 
you're you're not faced with the same limitations of making an actual game when designing a demo like this anyway so a very quick question for rich i'm interested in hearing the answer rich from somatic what is one game in your opinion that changed the gaming landscape the most um i saw this question on the docket earlier and it terrified me more than uh, the impromptu q a earlier <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but um it's one of these questions that's open-ended and could, could have like ten thousand possible answers but the one i'm going to go for september 1984 elite on the bbc micro so um if you consider what that game was doing in 1984 uh, you know, full 3D visuals, um, not just an open world, but an open universe, procedural generation. Um, they created, they cre- you know, a law. Um, they actually shipped it with a, with a novella that kind of set the scene. There's a lot of things happening there that, um, that kind of laid the foundations for the games that we play today. And uh, I was enthralled with it at the time. And um, yeah, that would be the one that I'd go for, I think. Uh, kind of curious about, yeah, I'm kind of curious about uh, what you guys would say quickly. Oof, there's, but there's so many different, there, I, I can't even begin. I'm already, my, my brain is turning a bazillion gears. The one that I think of just personally is Pack Picks. I had stopped reviewing video games. I had switched careers. And Pack Picks, I think that's the one where you draw Pac-Man and he comes alive on the DS or am I mixing up whichever one that one either way that game to me opened my eyes about touchscreen gaming in a way that other burgeoning things did not but you know ultimately I would say something like Angry Birds be changed the entire economy I know publishers who had changed everything once they realized oh my goodness this is how people are going to consume access and pay for games i'm not saying that's a great thing but that's one of those pivots like in terms of changing the industry forever and i'll stop there because i have other like actual games that i love that might fit in better in earlier eras but i'll let you guys go ahead if i had to pick one that i love and also had a huge impact i mean the classic for me is always doom i mean how influential was doom in so many areas of the industry it's so influential it's still felt today it's still revered uh yeah i mean what can i say it's just (laughs) The only right answer here is uh, twofold. It's Super Mario Brothers, and then it's Super Mario sixty four. It's just those are just, yep, between those, those, those two. As well. It changed everything. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank God Bubsy didn't come up. Jeez, that was going to be on the rest of my list. I promise. From VK Snacks or WK Snacks, is it possible, probable, that we could see tech like DLSS used to improve the experience of streamed video? Before you guys answer this, I desperately this is my digital foundry request for your team to analyze streaming video platforms take the frame rate of those and the uh compression artifacts that is the digital foundry video i want to see because the frame rate doesn't matter because it should be whatever the but film was just at. just that listen just take it and run with it all right back to the question there is actually technology at the moment um the name of it escapes me but uh in video are using um deep learning to clean up um, stuff like Zoom, you know, uh, voice communications, video communications, uh, and apparently it's really good. Um, in terms of cleaning up compression artifacts, I think um, the more obvious solution would be to come up with an entirely new compression scheme that is on both encoder and decoder um, to use in, in influencing that way. That would possibly help. Um, but I think this is basically going to be a situation where it, you know, just the gradual improvement in bandwidth that people have access to is going to eventually solve this issue. DLSS itself, I mean, I, I don't think it would really work specifically with video, and video requires sort of a spatial technique applied to it. And there, are, there are plenty of video upscaling algorithms, of course, but. Yeah, this this specific idea, I'm not sure about. I mean, I suppose the idea is that the the video feed going from a server to a player would be a lower resolution and then you would locally upscale. But then at that point, the streaming idea is that you're trying to use the simplest technology possible. And unless everyone starts shipping televisions with tensor cores built in to their uh, SOC, then it's kind of moot. The last question for today is from Ryan K. With OLED coming to the new Switch, do you expect Nintendo to make any OS changes to prevent burn-in or image retention? Or has the technology matured enough that these issues aren't a cause cause for concern? Is this where we talk about Rich's badass OLED monitor for uh, 47 minutes? Because I'm down. 
<laughs> um, Can you condense it down to 47 seconds? <laughs> um, this Switch uh, OLED, um, I think it's a combination of things. I think the technology has improved and um, is enough to prevent burning or image retention. But fundamentally, I just think the function of a handheld gaming machine is such that it's unlikely to be an issue in the first place. What do you reckon, John? I kind of always came back to the uh, the fact that the Apple phones ship with OLEDs for years now. And I feel like, you know, that there's a, they're being used by so many people and a lot of these people may not be the most tech savvy and it's kind of like putting it through sort of a, a a bulletproof kind of test where people abuse these things right they abuse their phones um and there i don't think there's been any widespread issues with them and of course obviously samsung many other companies have been using oled way before that I'm not saying anything otherwise i'm just saying it's like it's really in that sort of mass market space casual use kind of category to the point where I really don't feel like it's going to be a big issue on something like the Switch, necessarily. Was that burning on uh, Vita? Uh, I think it was possible, maybe. But uh, I certainly never encountered anything like that. But the Vita's OLED was actually pretty outdated as well. Like, I mean, It was great for the time, but it doesn't even offer perfect black levels, for instance, which is sort of a hallmark of, of OLED technology now. But uh, that one did not have that. Yeah, I guess the, uh, the the reason I brought it up is exactly because it's an old OLED technology and likely to be more prone to these kind of artifacts. I think actually uh, one thing I want to talk about, which um, came up in the Slack this week, which really excited me, was that you want to do the Switch OLED review. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Tell us why. Well, I feel like it's one of those times where whenever this these display technologies come up, I feel like I have to just... I need to take a close look at this stuff and really it's always a chance to get into the nitty gritty as to why this stuff matters and try to demonstrate it, that it's more than just like, there, there's more to it than just like being an OLED, I guess you could say. I, I, I don't know. Like to me, this kind of technology is very important to move away from LCD in general and try to help showcase, basically light the way, if you will. You know what I mean? Um, Organically I light the way. Yeah. I, I really want to put put it through its paces as well and see if if how this we haven't seen a device from Nintendo like this use such technology and I'm curious to see if they actually cut corners in a way that Nintendo often does. You know what I mean? Like what if this comes out and it's a 720p screen as we know um has anybody confirmed whether it has a, a like a pentile matrix for instance? Well, well here's the thing. I don't think they have. Um but um I, I did read the uh, the Eurogamer write-up, and this particular paragraph uh, sprung to mind. Uh, then, of course, there were the other benefits of the OLED screen. Perhaps sending along the colorblind member of the team wasn't the best approach, but but Nintendo is being selective with who's able to access the machine and remains reluctant to put it in front of the likes of Digital Foundry, who might be able to go a little bit in, more in-depth. And weeks after it was first shown off stateside, Photography of the Switch OLED remains prohibited, but it seems to be getting some pretty positive write-ups of the people who have been hands-on. So, um, yeah. These displays are so important to me personally, and I know a lot about them, and I feel like I can very quickly look at this and immediately judge where it falls on the scale, right? And I, you know, I've talked about this stuff for so long, I think people would be probably interested to hear, does this really deliver what you would hope from it? Or is this sort of a second-rate OLED panel? I mean, there's there's plenty of things that could go wrong with it that prevents it from being outstanding. But it could also be absolutely amazing. Uh, so we're going to have to wait and see. I have rung the bell so that I will get notified as soon as that is ready. <laughs> yes, to get instant updates. Instant. Yes, you said instant. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the, the Eurogamer write-up, it's, it's quite telling that, you know, Martin, who's... Uh, such a huge Switch fan, you know, it was the actually the kickstand that, that excited him the most about the product, which uh, is, is kind of crazy. And the and uh, the, the sound being better, which um, I don't know. It, the problem with display technology is that, you know, a lot of people are happy to go get a dirt cheap LCD and they're like, hey, it's a 4K LCD. And they're just like, this is great. Um, but there's a lot of us that are maybe not so accepting of that. And that's okay. Like, I'm not saying everybody should be a display snob. I'm just saying that, you know, for those of us who are pickier about our displays, there's a lot of questions that maybe people that have looked at it so far can't really answer yet. 
I, my, my biggest question of it is, can I put it up on tabletop mode and actually really, truly appreciate it while sitting with a friend at the pub? Because that was the initial pitch. And I tried that with Mario Kart early on and hated it. I've never done it again. It just the tabletop mode truly isn't enough for my old man eyes. So I'm not sure that that extra not quite inch of, of, of diagonal size is going to necessarily make that difference. But that combined with OLED, I'd love for that to happen. I'll tell you what, Sam. I've seen it happen with my own eyes. Uh, my son and his friend come come over and they played a lot of split screen Mario Kart that way. Literally set the thing on the floor, pull out the Joy Cons, they give you know one each, and then they're just playing it and having a good time. And if they if, if uh, that if the extra size works. and and the strength of an OLED panel in terms of brightness and color reproduction, if that can truly unlock that for more players, that is not a small sales pitch because that is still a fun use case. I still think that's a great idea. It is cool. It's also good for ergonomics because, you know, holding that switch is not the most comfortable thing. So, you know. <laughs> Gentlemen, I think that concludes this week's DF Direct Weekly. So thanks so much, John and Rich, for joining me on this episode. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. And of course, thanks so much to our special guest from Ars Technica, Sam. It was so great to have you on. I cannot wait for the next time you come and invade our show. Yeehaw! And on that note, if you like this episode, if you like our content, like, subscribe, ring the bell, and follow us on Twitter. It's going to be a lot of fun on the Patreon moving forward. We have lots of new stuff coming up. Lots of DF uh, Retro stuff. Lots of premium content stuff. You can't go wrong wherever you land on the tiers. But of course, I'm Adi signing off here, and have a good day. There's an awesome Twitter account of just inappropriate and bad YouTube thumbnails, and one of them today popped up with uh, Super Mario 64 and N64 on the left, and on the right was like uh, this version with Tom Selleck's face. Oh, I saw that. <laughs> yes. Awesome. The low render Mario and the Tom Selleck one. It's yeah. amazing. Oh, man. I mean, maybe he, maybe Mario's been Tom Selleck in disguise all along. Just think about Jumpman. He came from a certain era. We'll never know. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, it's either Tom Selleck or Ron Jeremy, and I, I'm going to wager on Tom Selleck. I'm going to wager Is this going Is this going to be like an outtake at the end? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Good, because it's gold. <laughs> it has to be. <laughs> I'm glad you're having. But fundamentally, fun. DLSS is on this uh, Super Mario 64 Wii compiler, and, yes. and it's looking good, and we're happy about it. But uh, yes. ultimately, the whole item has been ruined with this uh, mention of Ron Jeremy as Super Mario. It's been properly seasoned, is what I think you meant to say. <laughs> the sandwich keeps getting tastier. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs>